Uh, good stuff. So we've been in a series of sermons. We just got a couple more weeks on this, and um, it's called "What Puts a Smile on God's Face." It says in Second 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 Corinthians five nine, I think it says it says we make it our aim to please Him. And so I just think, what does it put a smile on God's face? Right? What makes our Father, our Heavenly Father, sit back, look at you and me, and say, "I love those guys." Not only do I love them and die for them, but they make me happy. And what they're doing makes me happy. Well done, good and faithful. What is, what is the well done part, right? That puts a smile on God's face and he, he's proud of you. He's proud of us. And so today what we're going to look at is just kind of like what we're talking about here. It's like when we, his people, his church, actually finish or fulfill the calling and the mission that he's given us. It's right, the Great Commission. He told us how. His strategy is a great commandment. It's like it's not building bigger churches. It's loving better. It's loving each other better and loving the world better. It's, it's representing Christ. It's, it's, it's a whole different strategy than sometimes what we figure because we think we can do it better than he does, and so we go about doing it a worldly way. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit because I want to push you from the pew into ministry. We're all missionaries 24-7. You represent God. You're called to be an ambassador. God has commissioned you like me and like Brady. It's like, but it's not about clergy laity. It's like, I'm just like you and you're just like me as sons and daughters of God, both equally with the same commission and hopefully equally with the same response. So we're going to do what we can wherever we are to fulfill what God asks us to do that we might glorify him, put a smile on his face, and actually be beneficial in the time that we live on planet Earth. And Philippians 1.6, actually there's only one chapter, I'm sorry, Philemon, it says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may understand every good thing that you have in Christ. In other words, as you engage in the mission. See, the mission isn't come to church, Right? It doesn't put a smile on God's face that you just came this morning, checked a box, called it good. That's not the in. This is not the goal. <laughs> what? I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Say yes to Jesus and go to church. Yeah, no, you missed it. <laughs> this is a means to an end, and if we never get to the end, see, we we put all these. Uh, labels and vision statements on churches like, okay, what's your vision? What's your, what, what is your church all about? Well, we want to love God and love people. Okay, great. Or we want to know him and make him known. Oh, that sounds cool. Well, we're fr- pretty good at the first part. Let's know him. But I think we failed big time at the second part, making him known or loving others. And so we do this, but then this without an end, it's like practicing baseball all your life and never playing a game. That's fun. It's like being, going to med school for 12 years after you graduate from high school, but never really going into practice, never actually helping anybody. Oh, I got all the training. I've been sitting at church for all my life. Whoop-de-doo. Good for you. But how has it benefited anybody else out there, you see? It's like, Dad, you want to put a smile on Dad's face? Guess what? When dad's out mowing the lawn and you got three teenagers and they're all sitting home watching their video games, what do you think would put a smile on dad's face? Mom's doing the dishes, young ladies, and uh, you're not. (laughs) What would put a smile on her face, right? What is the father's business today? What is he most interested in on planet Earth today? He died for sinners. He died for you and me. He loves us. And there's a world of them out there that don't know it. But he's trying. He's spent his spirit into the world every day that he raises the sun and the moon and the stars and and gives breath in your oxygen. He's hoping what? That somebody would go to church? Or somebody would come to Jesus? And where's his representatives? What are we doing about it? Yo, what? You want to put a smile on God's face? Mm. It's not what happens here on Sunday morning. This is a means to an end. It's what happens Monday through Saturday in your life, at your business, at your work, at your school, in your neighborhood that makes a difference. It's who you are on planet Earth. 
You're God's plan A. There is no plan B. God's strategy isn't build bigger churches so we can gather more people here on Sunday morning. God's strategy is you and me in the world making a difference, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, taking advantage of every opportunity, seeing every person. See, things have to change in my head and my heart if the job, the mission, the goal is to ever be accomplished. And this is a means to an end. And if this doesn't fulfill that end, then the question has to be asked, what are we doing in here? Is this purposeful at all? Is this just playing games, playing church? Is this what we're all about? You see, I, I served for 10 years in South America, me and my wife. And then God threw his curveball and said, I want you to come home back to the USA. We never intended to be back here except to visit family and friends the rest of our lives. When we said yes, we assumed it would be where no one else wanted to go. And I said, why are we back here? He says, because my church needs to be missional. My church needs to rethink. You see, I'm going to be your coach today. (laughs) You're the players. My job isn't to just preach to you every Sunday morning. Check this out. There's a a group of pastors that uh, put this together. And so I agree with some. This is what some of my fellow pastors says. I don't want to pastor a group of nice, polite church attenders who show up day after day, week after week, year after year, and waste time or... but I'm preaching to the same crowd over and over and over again. It's just the same people. And the second thing I don't want to do is try and entertain unbelievers. We're not in the entertainment business. And we're not just here just flapping our lips to try and, well, I don't know what. There's got to be something that happens as a result. They go on to say, I want to participate in the gathering, training, and releasing of an army of Jesus worshiping, people loving, barrier breaking world changers. That's what I'm about. That's what pastors are about is to train you up, excite you, build you up, train you, develop you, equip you so that you can go out and make a difference in the world. You're the salt and light of the world. My job is to train you up. Your job is to go out and get the job done. It's kind of funny how you expect that that's my job, huh? Oh, it's pastor's job. Let's just bring him to church, and he'll fish him, catch him, and it's like, clean him, and like, you know. A productive, fruitful life is what God wants. A people living in light of eternity, a people living on mission, a people fulfilling their calling. Then when we come together on Sunday, we have stories to tell about the life and move of God among us in the world, the testimony of God, because God's on mission. God's actually, you want to get out and put a smile on God's face? Grab the clippers and go out with Dad, who's mowing the lawn, who's saving the world, and you'll experience God like you never did before. You wonder why it's boring sometimes, your relationship, your Christianity, is because you're not engaged in the mission where God is. So here's here's my, I'm like way off. I didn't even touch my notes. Way off. (laughs) But this is what we're talking about, right? And this is like, I can talk about this all day. This is what I live for. I live to put a smile on my father's face by fulfilling the, the, the mission, the, the calling that he's called us to. And if you think you're unqualified, uh, you're not. God believes in you. Every one of you represent him well. You know who the greatest evangelists on the earth are? Brand new believers. The greatest representatives of God, those who just met him. All their friends are in the world. And they go back and they tell the, their friends about how good God is and how cool God is and what, what, because I never knew God and I used to think this, that, and the other. And it's like, he just showed up in a big way in my life. After two years, they say, most Christians don't have any non-Christian friends anymore. And we lose our contact with the world, we lose our influence, and we become religious. And the mission stops. Like, What? Yeah. Crazy, huh? 
You're a new believer. You don't know much. Guess what? You know more than anybody else on planet Earth about God. They think they know, but they don't get it from the source. So I'm, I'm, I'm one year saved. I'll just tell the story because I got a lot of stuff to tell you. But uh, So I'm one year saved. Got saved in 82, September. July 83, I'm in Chile, South America, on a short-term mission trip, two and a half months. And um, I'm supposed to be sharing my testimony one night, just kind of like Brady, but I want, in, the, in the gospel, like my story about how I came to know Jesus. And I don't speak Spanish very well at that point in time, like hardly at all. Jesus love you. <laughs> like burrito, taco, baño, right? That was about it. And I'm supposed to share, and I got this translator, but I talk too fast, and I'm like trying to spanglish it, right? And tell about Jesus and what he did in my life, and I'm just like a mess. We're in this little country town out in the middle of nowhere. And, of course, there wasn't anything going on in 83. There wasn't any movie theaters. There wasn't in Chile in this part of town. And so everybody kind of shows up when the gringos show up. And so this little church held 50 people, probably about the size of this over here, right here, just a little wooden building. And there's people, like, all around on the outside looking in the windows, right? And uh, no microphone. I'm just sharing, using my big boy outdoor voice and... And uh, afterwards, craziest thing happened. This dude from outside walks in, gives his life to Jesus. And I go, what? From that mess that I just shared? I don't, like somebody's life got touched in such a way that he was a gang leader of this gang in town. And so he got saved and eventually ended up becoming a pastor in that town, bringing his whole gang. On a mess like this that didn't speak Spanish, eight months saved, telling the story about what Jesus did in my life, I couldn't understand it. Somehow the Holy Spirit made him understand it. He'll take whatever we give, loaves, fishes, your small, ignorant, your effort means so much to him. Your willingness, your initiation, your involvement, just to open your mouth with all the fear that you have and share Jesus' goodness with somebody can change the world and somebody's life because the Holy Spirit has the power to do that. And you minimize it because the enemy's in your head saying, don't do it, you can't, and he'll want to take your weapons, take your confidence. It's not me, it's not you, it's him in us, through us. You see, all we do now is just Jesus for me. Oh, Jesus is my homie. Jesus, you know, we come to church because we want Jesus. And yes, he is for you. But he also wants to be in you. And then he wants to work through you. And if we don't go that whole spectrum, then what are we doing? What are we doing? It gets all messed up, and then we get bored. Oh, God didn't do it for me today. Well, maybe God wants to do something through you today. And then you go, wait, what? See, God's showing up all the time in people's lives because he's on mission. Anyway, is, should we start the sermon? <laughs> you ever been hungry? I'm talking Donner Party hungry. Okay. Not, not what we would say is hungry. <laughs> Probably here in America, we've never really been hungry. Donner party hungry. Desperate hungry. Eating roots, bugs and berry hungry. To the point where if we don't eat something, we're going to die. So we might eat that guy. This happened in the Bible. There was a siege by Aram... Ben-Hadad, the king, was besieging Jerusalem years without water or food, right? All the resources dried up. So you eat everything that you can, everything that's available, all the cows, all the dogs, all the chickens, all the worms, bugs, whatever. You, you, now there's nothing left. Cannibalism. Two women said, hey, today let's 
cook your baby and eat it, and tomorrow we'll cook mine and eat it. What, what, that's in the Bible? Yeah. So they cooked one baby and ate it. The next day, the other girl didn't want to. So the lady goes to the king and tells him, uh, lady's a liar. We ate my baby last night. She said, we're going to eat hers tonight. King got so, I mean, like you're probably having an emotional reaction right now. That's what happened to the king. He got so emotionally torn. He, he tore his robes. He got down in sackcloth. He cried out to God said, God, how long will we suffer? We're done. Uh, are we your people? Are we not? Are you going to do something? He sent a prophet. He said, you know, basically that day, a piece of bread sold for $1,000. He said, tomorrow, a loaf of bread will be sold for a half a penny. He said, that'll never happen. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, anyway, God sent a, on the army that was surrounding Jerusalem, and I'm telling you this so you don't have to read it all, but it's found in second. We're going to read a portion of Second Kings 7. The, the Lord confounded the army, made, it, made a huge sound. They thought that Israel had hired Egypt and uh, somebody else to come and sneak up on them and attack them. And so they just ran, the whole army. Well, we're going to pick it up right here in 2 Kings 7, 3 through 9. There were these four lepers that were in the town of Jerusalem. And they used to sit at the entrance of the gate. They said to each other, why should we stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we'll die. If we stay here, we'll die. So, hey, let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we die. Either way, we're dead. But there we have hope. There, there's a, a glimmer of hope. So at dusk, they got up and they went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. Because the Lord had called the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. And so they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and they fled in the dusk and they abandoned their tents, horses, donkeys, left the camp as it was, and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp. See, there's so much good application here. You and I are the ones with leprosy. We have a disease. We have a thing called sin. Well, they entered one of the tents. They ate and drank. Then they took the silver, golden clothes and went off and hid them. They came back another time and they went to another tent. They took some things and hid it. And they just like, yoo <laughs> Bang around. But this is a lottery, baby. Right? It's like, woo! And, and then... They said to each other, conviction hit them, and they said, what we're doing is, is right. This is a day of good news, and we're keeping it all to ourselves. Yeah. So they went and they told the Israelites and that they were freed. And there was so much plunder that they took that the next day a loaf of bread was sold for a half a penny where the day before... A piece of bread was sold for a thousand bucks. You and I have been forgiven a great deal. There's great good news has been poured out on us, and we understand it, and we've received it, and what are we doing with it? That's the question. What we're doing is not good. If we're just hoarding it and keeping it for ourselves. If we want to put a smile on Dad's face, we've got to share it with the world. We've got to live our lives in such a way that it makes a difference in somebody else's life. What is the goal of church? What is success? How do you measure it? We're not commanded to bring people to church. We're commanded to disciple them into a deeper relationship with Jesus. One where they will know him, trust him, Love him and obey him and fulfill his every desire to go wherever he sends every day. Every day. It's lordship. We talk about lordship, but we don't live lordship. You see, we're all 24-7 missionaries, and I don't care where you work. That's your field. Wherever you go to school, wherever, make a difference. 
It's not about putting beans on the table. That stuff heaven will pass away. It's you and I learning to live in light of eternity. It's you and I learning that life is fragile, that time is short, and we may never get this opportunity again. And it's taking advantage of every opportunity with every person God puts in front of you. And to do and go wherever he sends or says. And that may be, go to work today. Because I have plans for you with the people you work with every day. But will you see it? Will you respond in the way God wants you to? That's the question. I'm, you, I want you to go to school today. But I want you to go to school with a different... You work hard and you do all that because I'm training you to think well. We're going to train your brain at school. T train you to think, but here's what I want you to do. While you're at school studying, while you're at work putting together widgets, I want you to see the people around you. I want you to listen to my voice. I want you to live in such a way that with words or without words, you represent and you shine, yet the, like, like Brady was saying, to reflect my goodness, right? You don't have to say anything. It's just how you do what you do on planet Earth that makes a difference in people's lives. It's how you go through suffering. Dang, I have a car just broke down. I got to pay the bills on my way to work, and everybody at work hears about it because you showed up late. And it's like, oh, dang, that's so bad, so sad. And you go, it's good. God's got me. I'll take, you know, it's like, and so it's a, that's, that's that thing where it says in the Bible, it says, be ready to give an answer for everyone that asks for the hope that lies within you. So, wait, they're going to ask me for the hope that lies within me? Well, if you actually have hope, and you live in such a way that you reflect that you have hope, that God is with you, for you, in you, that, that changes the way we live, see? And the way we live should make a difference such that they go, you're a stranger on planet Earth, you don't act like the rest of us. You wear our clothes and you speak our language, but you're not like us. What is it about you? Where are you from? That's the way we ought to live. Well, our mission is clear. Uh, if you don't know it, I had some handouts for you, but they didn't get printed right. So I want you to understand this stuff, and I want to develop and train you. Our mission is clear. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right? I'm leaving, Jesus says, go make disciples of all the earth. Teach them to obey me. Acts 1.8, I'm going to send the promised Holy Spirit because your job is to be my witnesses. They said, uh, I thought we were going to be like the cool people in town. Let's build a big church and be cool and let's hang out and overthrow the Romans. No, that's not, a, that's not it. He said, I'm going to send my spirit. My spirit in your life is not just to make you happy. It's to use you to reach the lost. It's to transform you in such a way that you live naturally. I want this to be so very natural for you and I when we walk out of here. This is our identity, sons and daughters. It's not like evangelism is something we do. Erase that from your memory. Witnessing is who we are. Representatives is who we are. Ambassadors is who we are. Sons and daughters of God is who you are. It's you learning to live like a, a princess or a prince. That's what has to happen. So that when we go out, it becomes very natural for us to represent our Father. It's not something we do. It's who we are. You get the difference? And so they said, oh, should we, you know, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father is set by in his own authority. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The purpose for the Holy Spirit coming upon you is to be his witness in this world. It's to transform our lives and to open our eyes to see Jesus, who is our Lord. Like I said, now it's plan A, there is no plan B. You're the light and you're the salt of the world, so season in the atmosphere with grace and truth. Push back evil, love intentionally, be proud of your freedom and your identity in Christ, bring hope and healing to those in this world who've been beat up, knock their knees around in the darkness and share God's good news of grace with and without words. I'm going to read this. It's, it's a little harsh, but uh, you'll get the point. What good are we if we just hide away in our holy huddles and keep the blessings of God all to ourselves, scared, selfish consumers? Um, 
Oh, that wasn't it. That was pretty harsh too, but... Oh, here it is. Uh, we need to learn to be, you know... Uh, blah, 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 blah. You know, when we come together, we heal wounded hearts and we heal wounded... And we get beat up in the world for sure. Here, here's a problem I have. If you're out doing the work of the Lord and you get bloodied, you get persecuted, the enemy comes against you, say, and for no reason, no fault of your own, your car breaks down, no fault of your own, your boss gets angry because you're a believer and he fires you. That's the stuff we care for each other. We, we run to each other. We, we are for each other. My problem is self-inflicted wounds. Self-inflicted wounds of deserters. They're not in the battle. They're not fighting like you are, like I am, like we are. They've, they're, they're at the bar in town with the enemy. Oh, and they got a boo-boo and crashed. And then they run back home and say, it's my job, your job, to." You see, I, so there's something weird about that. I know it sounds harsh. It's just like, your battle wounds are our concern. We don't shoot our wounded. We care for each other. Christopher, you've got to help me say this well. You've got to figure out a class to put on this. Christopher is the president of the Nevada Bible College. We want to train you and equip you so well that you can do this naturally. You know, like playing music, you learn the fundamentals, and all of a sudden you can play jazz, and you don't have to think about it, and you go, dang, I want to be like that guy. Well, you can be. Just start practicing. You're being recruited. I'm just going to land the bird. You get the point. Every one of you has been recruited. During World War II, I just went back, did some fun search, Everybody was in the war. Well, not everybody, but most countries, right? World War. Italy, France, Denmark, Canada. I mean, I went back and looked at World War II uh, recruitment posters. <laughs> Everybody's recruiting somebody. Go ahead, then, Christine. Let's, let's look at a few of those real quick. You know... For home and country, uh, show me the next one. Just let's run to these. Give me about three seconds. Who's absent? You? Where are you? You're supposed to be fighting for the battle. Follow the flag and list. Navy, Army, Air Force, Marines, right? Hold up your end. Ladies, kids, everybody was doing something. At home or abroad, everybody was in the war. It didn't matter whether you had a gun in your hand. You were doing something to win this battle. Everybody in every country was being enlisted, recruited, right? Stubby the war dog. Everybody's in it. It's like, sign your dog up. Go to, you know, get food to the soldiers. Save your medal. Everybody was doing something because... We could all, we are all Im impacted by this war. Guess what? We're in a war. And every one of you and every one of your friends and every person on planet Earth is in this war and is being impacted by the war. And God's re recruiting you and your kids at whatever age you are to make a difference because there's something that we need to do and there's something we can do. The question is, are we doing it? So how do we get it done? What is God's strategy? It's not bigger buildings. His strategy is you in the world today, every day, every breath, living intentionally, and these four things have to happen, and they're on my note sheet, and I can get them to you later. I can put them online. You can pull these up. You must be convinced and convicted by the fact that people without Jesus are doomed. You just got to, I mean, why, why would he die? Because he didn't have anything better to do. Oh, I thought it would be fun today. It would be a cool story to tell. 
Oh, we could take communion to that. That would be kind of fun. No, he died because without his death and resurrection, there would be no forgiveness. I mean, this is a Christian biblical worldview. Whether you believe it or not, you can just study that on another day, but I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. People without Jesus are going to stand before the Father and have given account of their own sins. And if you don't have Jesus this morning, he died for you. That you don't have to do that. You can be free. Grace is free. Forgiveness is freely offered to anyone who would. But people who don't, people that don't hear, and we don't want to, it's not time to split hairs. What about those who never heard? What about those? We do that on Wednesday night. Plug. Wednesday night Bible study. (laughs) Get into the Bible. So that's when we have fun talking about that stuff. Number two, you must be aware and acknowledge that time is short, life is fragile, and you may never get this opportunity again. You don't have tomorrow, you have today. Number three, you must understand that if we don't do the work, it won't get done. And that's not on God. That's on you and me. Don't be blaming God that people are in hell. He died to save them, and he sent you to tell them. Number four, you must know that you have what it takes to reproduce. It's built into your DNA. God believes with the help of the Holy Spirit, you and I can do it. He believes in you. He trusts us. He has commissioned us. Melissa, come on forward. Let's get these good people home doing what you're supposed to do today. Go make a difference. We've all been recruited. Now will we enlist? I start with that story of hunger, and and here's what I'm convinced of. The world is under siege. The spirit of mankind is being starved. And you see it. You know how I notice it? What do people do when they're under siege and they're starving? I mean hungry, Donner Party hungry. They start eating themselves. First it gets irritating and we start bickering and fighting with each other. And then we start picking off each other. And right now, just COVID, suicide rates are up. What do people do when they're starving? They'll just kill themselves. They'll just walk off a cliff. They'll just end the pain, end the suffering. It's just happening. Our, our spirit is starved. And the enemy has us besieged. And you know what else people do? They do funny things when they get hungry. They start eating shoes, bark, they'll eat anything. We are so gullible today, we'll eat anything. Hope that it will satisfy our soul and our need and our spirit. And it doesn't. And so then we get desperate. We just want to end it all, and suicide becomes an option, or cannibalism. I'll just shoot you, kill you, and maybe that'll make me feel better. At least I'll have something to eat today, but it doesn't satisfy. And so I know I'm getting dramatic about this, but I'm passionate about this, and I think our Heavenly Father's passionate about that. If he would send his son, that's a radical thing. There must have been a radical problem that needed to be fixed that could only be fixed by his blood. And that radical problem exists today, but it's been solved, but no one knows about it. We're the lepers who are, are we going to keep it to ourselves or are we going to share it with the world? We take communion here at Outlook every week, and really the deal is when I look at the wondrous cross, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, everything else fades away, right? My richest gain means nothing. You see, the work really has to do with understanding the grace and the the love of God for me. It's like, to the degree that I value and I'm grateful for what he did for me, I just want to tell somebody else about it. It's like he just fed my soul. I just went from starvation to life. I went from brokenness to freedom. I went from leprosy to health. I went from slave to son. 
I went from darkness to light. And it's for not just me, it's for everybody. And he says to you and to me, are you glad that I did what I did for you? Would you do me a favor? If you want to say thanks to me, one, worship me in spirit and truth, but two, go tell somebody else about it, would you? Would you just do that for me? Because I'm busting my butt out here, God says. I'm sweating in the hot sun, and you're at home playing video. Would you just come out and help me in the yard a little bit? Would you, would you join me in my work, my family? That's what I hear when I hear the heart of God. Do I love God and do I love people? Do I know the time is short? And this gift is for all. So as we take communion today, we do it this way here. If you're new with us, and I know there's a lot of new folks today, it was great to meet you. And I know we're a little OT this morning too because Melissa talked a lot and Brady talked a lot. Not me. It was those guys. Um, so we have five, one, two, three, four, five communion tables, and we just get up because Jesus invited you. And one of the things that culture we're trying to create is that you respond in body and soul and heart and mind that you say yes to Jesus. And this is part of it, so that when we get up and we go to the communion table and say, Jesus, I'm doing this for you. I don't pass things. We don't pass offering. We don't. You guys do what you want to do. Do it for the right reason. That's what we're trying to teach you. And when you leave here, you go out into a war zone, a battlefield, a mission field. You go out into a world of darkness as a representative of light. Go do it because it's in your heart to be that. Be his son. Be his daughter. Be proud of it. And so we're going to give you just a couple minutes. Go ahead and stand up, outlookers. Show them the way. And uh, you can talk. You can pray with each other. You can take it solo. But what I want you to do is just really reflect on... the grace that has been poured out on you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. As the Father sent me, I send you. As you take it, know that it was not just for you, but for you so that you might be blessed to be a blessing. finish with a closing song in just a couple minutes but I want to give you time to meet with Jesus one on one but we finish our time with just another worship song and time of prayer and if you don't know Jesus and you've never experienced his grace and love and I know I'm talking to the church this morning primarily but I want you to know that God poured out his son's life for you makes all the difference in the world not just in eternity but even on planet earth how we live and what we live for music starts, I want to have our prayer team come on forward. If you have prayer for anything, need prayer, need healing so you can get back into the battle. Want to walk in the light, as Brady said, not just half a light. You got some things you need to lay down and confess and get healed from, do that.